Welcome everybody to our first program here from the Niagara County, the History Center of Niagara County uh, as part of our um, exhibit and program, The Lockwood Legacy, Belva Lockwood and the Fight for Equal Rights in America. Our first uh, speaker's program is Belva Lockwood, Pioneer Educator, and being presented by Anne-Marie Linneberry, uh, the Education Director here at the History Center, and Independent Educator, Jean Neff. Um, so before we begin, uh, I just want to say um, that funding uh, for this program has been provided in part by Humanities New York with support from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Any views, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed uh, by the speakers uh, do not necessarily represent those of the National Endowment for the Humanities. Uh, so thank you all for joining us and um, we'll begin. I'll start with our first speaker, Anne-Marie Lineberry. Okay, I need the first slide. Um, okay, good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to be talking about Belva Lockwood, but of course, Belva Lockwood started out as Belva Ann Bennett. She was born on October 24th, um, 1830, in a log cabin on Griswold Street in Royalton, New York. And she was born on the property of John Layton. You can see where the star is on the map. She was the second child and the second daughter of Lewis and Hannah Green Bennett. They were tenant farmers, so they moved around. They didn't really own property. And they later had three more children. So there were five children all together in the family. Okay. Next slide. Okay. Carrie? Well, Waiting. I'll just keep talking about Carrie? Belva. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, she was considered to be an intelligent just and. Uh, just click on the screen and then advance the slides. So sometimes you need to unshare, switch the slide, and share again. It hangs up. That happens to me. For me, for me um, sometimes you just need to click again on the screen where the slide is and then advance the slide. I'll try that. Can you see us? You mean what, on the screen? Yes. It's my first slide and then on the right there's five okay. windows, we, open windows. Are we, are we seeing the slide? We're seeing the slide, but it okay. hasn't advanced. Okay, now. <laughs> yeah, it's advanced. Can I continue? Okay. There we go. okay. All right. Um, Belva was considered to be an intelligent and a very precocious child. She read the entire Bible um, by the age of 10, and she actually tried walking on water and moving a small hill by concentrating uh, on her faith alone. And of course, trying to walk on water ended up uh, to be kind of a uh, very wet experience and she received a scolding from her family. She would also have been considered a tomboy uh, at what we would call a tomboy today. She liked running and climbing trees and crossing streams and she wasn't afraid of uh, reptiles and snakes and things like that. But she also liked to go off at times to find a quiet place where she could think and read and write. She attended um, the local district schools. There was one right down the road from her, district number four, which, whoops, Sorry. that's okay. <laughs> oh, we need to go back. She attended uh, district number four, which later became district 22. 
and she was considered an exceptional student. Um, and by the age of 12, she had already completed all the requirements for grammar, geography, arithmetic, algebra, and philosophy. Um, she was very disheartened when her father did not encourage her in her scholarship because she was a girl. She also was annoyed because he also did not recognize her physical labor that she did on the farm, which equaled that of her brothers. Now, by the time she was done with her elementary school uh, classes at age 14, even though she had completed the requirements at 12, she was now qualified to teach school. So she ended up teaching at one of the district schools in Royalton. She boarded with the students' parents, but the money she earned went to her family because they were always financially strapped. She only received half the pay of the male teachers in the school district. And this is a quote from Belva. She said that that was odious, an indignity not to be tamely born. I at once began to agitate this question, arguing that pay should be for work and commensurate to it and not be based on sex. The rationale for this disparity was that men had to support themselves at their family, women were supported by male relatives, fathers, husbands, and brothers. She asked her father to uh, allow her to continue her education, but he told her girls did not need an education. So, next one. Okay. So, in 1848, at the age of 18, she took what she called the well-trodden road to marriage. She married Uriah McNall. He was a farmer and a sawmill operator uh, in Royalton. And for Belva, this wasn't really what she wanted to do, but she was from a poor working farming family, and this was what was expected of her. A year later, their daughter Laura was born in 1849, but that same year, oh, I'm gonna do the next one. That same year, her husband, Uriah, was injured in a sawmill accident. And for the next four years, he was unable to work. So during that time, she actually operated the sawmill for him. And she operated it very successfully and very profitably. And she became very well respected by her male neighbors. Okay. In 1853, so four years after the accident, uh, Uriah McNall passed away. He died, leaving Balva a widow with a small child, a young child. Okay, you can go to the next one now. So Balva decided that now her future was in her hands and she was going to do what she wanted and not what other people wanted her to do. So she enrolled at the Gasport Academy in Gasport, New York, and she studied geometry, German, um, anatomy, physiology, and bookkeeping. So very diverse uh, curriculum. In order to pay for this, she taught at various school districts in the area. And one of the districts that one of the sources mentioned that she taught at was the Terry's Corners School District in Royalton. Another source says she taught at the Gasport Academy where she had attended. But in either case, she did teach in the school districts in that area to earn money so that she could continue her education. And, okay, next one. So in 1854, so a year after Uriah's uh, death and a year after she had started uh, teaching school, she decided to enroll at the Genesee Wesleyan Seminary in Lima, New York. And at that time, the only course that she could enroll in was called the ladies finishing course. And that was in September of 1854. 
While she was there, they opened up the scientific course to women. This had been denied them before that. So a year after she started, she was able to enroll in the scientific course at the Genesee Wesleyan College. There were two different schools, but they were on the same campus. And the scientific course involved classes in science, history, and politics, and other manly topics. During that time, she also snuck off campus several times to attend lectures that were given by a local lawyer. And she also went to see Susan B. Anthony speak when she came to Lima. So she finished the four-year program in three years, and she graduated in on uh, June 27th, 1857. Okay, next one. Now she was immediately offered a job at the Lockport Union School here in Lockport. And this was something she accepted rather reluctantly because what she wanted to do was she wanted to try to find either a law school or a lawyer who would take her on so that she could become a lawyer herself. But she took the job because she knew she had to continue supporting her daughter. So she became the uh, preceptress or um, principal of the girls department in the fall of 1857. Once again, she was paid less than the male instructors who had less education and less experience than she did. But this is what she wrote. As a teacher, I did not content myself with the knowledge that I had already acquired, but strove each day to gather up some new thoughts in each of the branches pursued by my respective classes. Um, okay. She was appointed to a New York State Committee with Susan B. Anthony to determine if declamation, which is another word for public speaking, should be taught to girls in school. She immediately implemented the program in, at the Lockport Union School, and then she wrote, the improvement was marked, and the success so great that declamation for the girls became the standing order for the school forever after, and the report of the committee was favorable. So this was something that Belva believed in. She believed that women should be able to speak for themselves in public. Okay. She also um, introduced calisthenics uh, to her classes at the Lockport Union School. And she felt that women should be able to have exercise just like the men. And she used a book that had been recently published by Catherine E. Beecher, which was the book of the Lock um, physiology and calisthenics. Now, this was kind of... Um, radical at that time for women to be doing exercises, especially in public, which was considered at school. But she felt that it not only was good for the body, but it was also good for the mind as well. And so she uh, implemented this practice and it stayed at the school. After four years at the Lockport Union School, she resigned from exhaustion, but also discouragement over pay discrimination. And yet, the superintendent of the school, his name was James Atwater, he praised her as a lady of great energy and executive ability who filled her position for four years to the entire satisfaction of the official board, pupils, and patrons of the school. But yet, he would not pay her the equal pay that the men were getting, so, okay. So what she did then was she decided that she wanted to run her own school. But she went to a school in Gainesville, female seminary in Gainesville. And even though she was not uh, really in charge of it, she did have more uh, freedom than she had at the Lockport School. Um, and she continued to teach public speaking classes and calisthenics. But the woman who uh, ran the school there did not always agree with what Belva was teaching, and so they had uh, some disagreements. And not long after Belva arrived at the school, it burned down. And it was rebuilt, and Belva 
ended up finishing the term in 1862, but then she left because of the disagreements with the other uh, headmistress. And she taught at a school in uh, Hornell, which is in Steuben County. She did that for a year, um, but I was unable to find out much about that school at all. So, so that after a year, okay, we can go to the next one. She went and she purchased a female seminary in Owego in Tioga County. And she operated this for three years before selling it at a profit. And it was at this point that she decided that she really wanted to pursue a career in law. And so using the profit from selling the school, she, she took her daughter, Laura, they moved to Washington. She did open up a school in Union Hall in Washington, D.C. to pay for her expenses. But within a few years, she was attending National uh, University and working on her law degree. And now I'm going to turn the program over to Jean Neff. And Jean is going to discuss what it was like to be a student as well as a teacher in a one-room schoolhouse in the 19th century. Hello, yes. Um, so I will just tell you a little bit about my background in that um, I have worked at several museums that have one room schoolhouses. Um, so I have been able to gather lots of information from that, um, as well as certainly have visited lots of places with one room schoolhouses. Um, but I did bring with me today just to say that I have had all kinds of different books. Here's one where an individual tells of her experience in a one-room schoolhouse. Um, and since I am from Otsego County, Cooperstown, um, this is a book that's just about one specific district in Otsego County. And there's wonderful illustrations and information about each of the many one-room schoolhouses that were there. Um, and expanding beyond that is Schoolhouse John, a man who uh, took many, many years to discover all the schoolhouses in all of Otsego County. So this book, very thick with all kinds of information. Um, but just to show you how this interesting range of information is out there, specifically about schools. And then, of course, there are the um, books that have information about schools um, specifically, or like this, the Pioneer Sampler has some of my favorite illustrations, which I can share with you. Emery's going to show some images. Um, oh, Terry. Oh, Terry's going to have yeah. <laughs> of things that I have gathered. Um, yeah, they, they should have should have started right at the, after my last. And, and I should say, slide. I worked in Owego for ten years, <laughs> and only slightly came across Delva Lockwood, because um, I of course was dealing with lots of other ones at that time. This is um, one of the one-room schoolhouses that's at the Buffalo Niagara Heritage Village um, here in Erie County. It, uh, um, just one of the schoolhouses that they had, and this is one of the, the later one where it's bigger. Um, has a little bit more um, things, but you can see that one-room schoolhouses, it took years and years to um, get them with lots of supplies, lots of comfortable uh, situations, the heat, the light, all those kinds of things. Um, so this is the one schoolhouse. The next one. Um, this is inside that schoolhouse, and you can see that by the end of the 19th century, um, the desks would have included um, metal, which of course then means expensive, but they certainly were much more practical, much nicer than what came earlier on at that time. Okay, next. Oh, I specifically wanted to add this. This comes um, a little differently in another book, um, but I like the fact that it's got the portrait of George Washington and Abraham Lincoln to say that when we compare what was going on in schools long ago and, and what um, is still there today or certainly for years later, 
Um, by the end of the 19th century, just about all schools would have had these pictures uh, in the classroom. And certainly um, it was something that was continued on into the 20th century. I'm not sure when it finally did um, change, but certainly a long span of time to have that. Yes, next one. Um, this is a book that I have um, that was done by Grandma Moses, his son, who also was a wonderful artist. And what he did in his book was to take the story of Mary Had a Little Lamb that follows her to school. And he has wonderful illustrations of the schoolhouse, um, not just the wonderful lamb and the story. Very typical, typical, wonderful house, the center door, uh, a, a school with um, a swing on the tree, um, something that the children really wanted, didn't always get any kind of equipment outside to play on, but it's a wonderful example of a typical school um, in the 19th century. Yes, next. Um, this is one of my favorite paintings, a Winslow Homer of the young men at the schoolhouse during recess playing um, oh, no, I wrote it once. Snap the Whip, <laughs> um, which um, was a very popular game, though dangerous because the poor child or children on the end often uh, couldn't run that fast and ended up rolling away and, and sometimes getting hurt. And so it does show up in lots of different books and documents and whatever that many teachers said no, boys were not allowed to play Snap the Whip. And I heard that even um, in more recent times, um, the teachers, again, that said um, way into the 1930s and 40s, it was um, a game that had been around a long time, but most teachers found it was too dangerous, and therefore they would say, no, they can't play that. Okay, next. Ah, and this is a painting that's at the Fenimore Art Museum, a place I did work, because um, I worked on both sides of the street. I worked at the Art Museum. I also worked at the Farmers Museum with their wonderful One Room Schoolhouse. But the title of this wonderful painting is called Kept In, where you can see by the sad look on the child's face that um, recess is going on outside, but um, for whatever reason, some uh, thing that she did that the teacher has uh, told her she has to stay in. It, it's also a wonderful example of how crude and how simple um, schoolhouses, uh, the desks made out of wood that were certainly um, not costing hardly any money, which of course schools didn't have to spend on um, things at all, hardly at all. So it's a very good example of how crude is them. I will say that at one time, when I was working in the one-room schoolhouse across the street in the pharmacy museum, a fourth grader walked into that schoolhouse and said to me, oh, this is bleak. I love that he used that word. It's a word we hear today for <laughs> the situation we're in, um, in 2020. Um, but just the fact that there's so little um, equipment, supplies, or whatever in the classroom. And I think that's probably where we are next, right? Yeah. I think yes, that's the last one. Yeah. Okay. Um, just a couple of other quick ones. Can we see my? Um, in my Pioneer Sampler book, this is the schoolmaster with the boys standing in front of him. Okay. Um, and here's another one from the book too. I'm sorry, they didn't photocopy better. I have, I have always kept lots and lots of copies of things talking about how schools were laid out. Um, and as you can imagine, just like teachers would today, probably maybe even more long ago, where the benches were, where the um, desks were, and where the cloakroom was, which of course is what they called it in the 19th century. And in my school days, we called it the cloakroom. It's only now we call it um, the coat room, <laughs> um, or you have your um, coats being kept in a locker or whatever. Um, I'm always fond of lots of information about what they were doing, what the 
day was like, and this is a good example of, um, and that's another thing that changes from school to school, time to time, that they first start talking about school starting at nine and going to five. There's even one reference of school starting at 8.30 in the morning, and going to five, but it definitely varied. Um, there's even information in one school that in the winter time, because they really were dependent on daylight and the children having to do chores before they went to school. And when they got home, the school day might have been as short as nine to three. So all of that changes, changes, changes. Um, but here's just an example of some of the class information they would have had. My last one is um, there's always information about um, not just all the punishments, um, standing in the corner, uh, holding on to two heavy books, being kept in like the wonderful painting was. But there is also the uh, recognition of students doing great work. And these are called uh, rewards of merit. And there are several samples around out there that are really, really very nice about uh, a teacher uh, writing this little note and sending it home to the parents of how good the student has done. Okay.